me and thanks uh, Nikhil. Uh, I guess, yeah, Nikhil told me my main objective is to aim the level so that experts will be bored. So I guess, you know, I really want to uh, make sure Nikhil is bored. So if you see Nikhil either engaged or interested, let me know and I'll either talk about something else or slow down. Okay, so we are uh, talking about stochastic methods in our pathwise analysis in the Boolean hypercube. What I'll do is mainly just kind of introduce a few tools and basic things. I'll prove a, a few theorems using stochastic methods. I won't prove a lot of new theorems. Maybe we'll have time to, to prove just one new theorem. Uh, most of the things I'll prove actually have different proofs by proofs by more classical techniques, but the aim here is, you know, just to learn the technique rather than to, you know, learn how to prove new theorems. Uh, just to make sure, you, um, can you say something? I just want to know that I can hear you if someone is not following so I think uh, we have to use the mic to for you. I to see, hear. I see, I see, I see. So I don't know. Try to stop me if someone has a question. Okay, I, I want to take it slow and I want to make sure everyone is following. Okay, so let's start with a with the proof of the Poincaré inequality, which I guess you all know. This proof is going to be a bit of an overkill in terms of tools, but I think but it's going to lead us to being able to prove more sophisticated things. So the first thing I want to remind you is what a multi-linear extension of a Boolean function is. Yes, are you writing, Ronan? Because we don't see it. Not today. I am writing. Okay. Maybe there's wow. a Wow, yeah, it's very slow. Can you remind us what the Poincaré inequality is? Also, yeah, can you remind us what the Poincaré inequality is? Yeah, sure. Let, let, let me remind you what the Poincaré inequality is. Yeah, it's, I don't know why is it so slow, though. Um, this is going to be, okay. Hopefully it's gonna improve. So the Poincaré inequality says the following thing. Uh, if I have a Boolean function, I can define the i influence of f. So for f Boolean function, let's say from, no, listen, I think I'll, I'll try to reconnect with my iPad, right? What are you saying, Akil? It's it's like really annoying, and it usually works fine. Sure, yeah, this is slow, so we could try again. Yeah, if there's a different device. Yeah, sorry about that. I have no idea why this is happening. I did this so many times, and it always works fine. Yeah, uh, you know what? I think maybe it improved. Okay, let let's do one last attempt. Like, can you see me highlighting the word yes. inequality yeah. now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we yeah. do. Okay. Okay. So if I have a Boolean function, uh, or let's say two zero one, I can, we denote the i influence of f by simply the expectation over the uniform measure that uh, of the of del i of f where the i discrete derivative of f at x is equal to you know uh, f at x where i set the i coordinate to be 1 minus f at x, where I said the i coordinate to be minus 
So Ronan, there is a lag. Um, is it also on your end or? Um, I let 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 me just reconnect because it's going to be. Yeah. Right. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Ah, it there is a button optimized for video. Okay, now I see there is no lag, but the quality is very crappy, right? Can you see my screen? Like, yeah, but you can barely read. Um... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really don't get it. Like my Wi-Fi connection is like really good. Sorry. Let let me reconnect to the Wi-Fi. Just gonna restart soon. You still don't see anything, right? No, still, still the blurry. Oh yeah. Yeah. Better, not perfect, but still. Yeah, not perfect, but I think we'll have to go with this. Uh, yeah, I think it's legible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, but is there a you, delay, or can you? I I think there is no delay now. Uh, yeah, this looks better. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, really not perfect. You know what I mean? But this is good, yeah. If this... Yeah, it's good. Okay. Yeah, sorry. I have no idea why this is happening. Okay. So if I define the influences like this, which is just 
you know, the probability that toggling the ith coordinate is going to toggle the value of the function f, the Poincaré inequality, which is probably the most basic inequality uh, or the most basic concentration inequality on the hypercube states that the variant of f is bounded by the sum over i of i i of n. And yeah, what, I, what I'm gonna do first is give you a pretty convoluted proof of this, which will be useful because we're, we're gonna be able to extend it pretty easily to uh, stronger inequalities. No, I think I li listen. I think this is let. Let me try one last thing. Sorry about that. Let me actually try to um, go closer to the Wi-Fi router. Maybe it's the connection. Uh, Ronan, don't you usually square the derivative? It doesn't matter because it's Boolean. Right, the square of like plus minus one is yep. equal to the absolute value. Sorry, uh, let me try to get closer to the router. Maybe that's. I don't know if it's better or not, but let's go with this for now. Okay, uh, so what's the multilinear extension of the Boolean function? So I guess this you all know, I can always write f of x as the Fourier decomposition, so the sum over all subsets of the nth coordinates of the n coordinates of some coefficient that depends on the subset. So this is sometimes called the Fourier transform of F times the characteristic function of this subset. Right now, we're we're actually not going to care at all about the values of those coefficients. The only thing we care about is that there exists such a representation, which identifies with f on, you know, the discrete hypercube. But we're going to use it outside of the discrete hypercube. So this is actually defined for all x in Rn, and in particular, for all x in the convex hull of the discrete hypercube, right? And it has a very, and like by definition, it's multilinear. And since it's multilinear, it's also a harmonic function, which is, kind of go, going to be uh, what's going on. Uh, which is going to be useful for us later on. Next, I want to define uh, the following thing. I want to define a stochastic process, yeah. x0. What's a harmonic function, Ronan? Ah, 
The harmonic function is a function whose uh, Laplacian is zero. So, um, second derivatives, yeah. Exactly. So now it's going to be continuous and not discrete derivative. So for all x, if I look at, you know, the sum over all i of del, uh, In fact, it's much more than that. Like each, you know, each of the second derivatives is actually zero, right? Because if I take the derivative twice in the same direction, I just get zero. But we're just going to use, in a sense, the harmonicity. Okay, now let's define uh, the following stochastic process, x0, x1, up to xn. I want to define it as follows. So these are all going to be points in minus one, zero, or one to the n. And I want to take k1 up to kn to be a random permutation. of the numbers one to n. And that and epsilon one up to or up to epsilon n to be a Bernoulli uh, plus minus ones. I choose plus or minus one with probability half iid. And then I want to define x i minus x i minus one to be epsilon i times the standard basis vector k i. So just, you know, e one up to E and it's a standard basis. So basically what I do is like the process X I starts from the center at any point in time, it chooses one of the coordinates uniformly, it chooses uniformly at random one of the remaining coordinates in which it didn't jump yet. And in this coordinate, it jumps to plus or minus one with probability one half. So maybe it starts here and then it's going to jump like over here and then it's going to jump over here. So this will be like x0, x1, x2, okay? So, you know, clearly um, Xn is going to be uniform in the discrete hypercube, which means that, you know, if I now define Mi to be F of Xi, then the variance of Mn is just the variance of f, right? And recall that I want an upper bound on the variance of f by the sum of the influences, right? And I claim that also the sum of the influences of f is by definition equal to, or maybe let's write one over n, the sum of the influences of f, is by definition equal to the uh, expectation of m i minus m i minus one 
square. Why? Because, well, if we go back to this picture, you know, so the, maybe this coordinate jumps first and then the second and the third, and maybe the last coordinate that jumps is like this coordinate. So, you know, mi will be f at this point. Sorry, mi minus one will be f at this point. mi will be f at, you know, one of those two points. And then the difference between this and this is just going to be, you know, What's written in the brackets is basically like, uh, sorry, okay, I guess there is a factor two that I'm missing, but this is basically, uh, you know, the gradient, the partial derivative in the ki direction of f at xn. Uh, square. Maybe just <coughs> which is, you know, equal to the influence of the ki coordinate uh, so there is a question uh So why is this true when i is not equal to n when some of the coordinates might be zero? Sorry? Why is this true when i is not equal to n when some of the coordinates might be zero? Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry about that. I'm... This should be an n. My bad. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. This is n, and this is n, and this is n, and this is n. Sorry, sure. Okay, I'm glad someone is uh, following. Yeah, it's it's just the last one, right? It's we basically reveal coordinates by coordinates, and the jump that we have in this process m i with respect to the last coordinate that we reveal. That's just like equal to, you know, the influence of the last coordinate. And if we take expectation, it's just, you know, the expectation over all the influences, right? Now, an easy fact that's gonna be useful for us is that the process MI is a martingale. Do we need to, Nikhil, what do you say? Everyone knows what a martingale is or? Maybe quickly remind. If... Yeah, sure. So that just means that the expectation of mi given all the past. So the past here is x zero up to xi minus one is equal to you know, so um, so so I claim that in the end it's going to be equal to uh, m i minus one. And what's the reason for this? Um, you know, this is just. 
so it's equal to the expectation of m i given x not up to x i minus one, and also k i. So suppose I al already know in which coordinate I'm going to jump in the i step. And then, you know, I, ca I can take expectation over ki. So this is just the same. Now, what is this? This is, so here the only randomness I have, I already know in which coordinate the process is going to jump. The only randomness is, you know, this epsilon i. So here it's just, you know, equal to with probability one half, I am jumping, you know, to x i minus one plus plus e um, i, sorry, k i. And with probability one half, minus e k i, right? And the point is that f is linear over you know this line that is spanned by these two uh, points, right? So the average is just the average. So this is. Just Right? So this is the martingale. And for martingales, we have a pretty nice property saying the following thing. So for any martingale, so for, for any process, mi such that the expectation of mi uh, given, you know, everything that happened until uh, maybe. everything that happened until, you know, m i, I minus one is equal to m i minus one. So if you have this, then the variance of M uh, at any time I maybe let let me M I two minus M maybe let's okay don't want to burden you with notation M J minus M I is equal to the expectation of the sum of all uh, T between I and J of m t minus m t minus one squared. So I guess uh, many of you have seen this. I mean, to, to see why this is true, you just open the brackets and you see that the only terms that are not zero in expectation are basically the squares of, so, you know, I, I can just write the variances like this, a telescopic sum. Should I do this? Okay, let me do this. So, you know, this is just mj minus mj minus one plus mj minus one minus m. J minus two, et cetera, et cetera.
the square of this, if I, you know, just open the brackets, I get a bunch of terms that, you know, I, I get the squares of like these terms, which are exactly these terms, but also I get, you know, for example, this term times this term in expectation is just zero because, you know, the expectation of MJ given every, all of this is just MJ minus one, right? So. Okay. So, you know, this is a very simple fact, but it's going to be very useful for us. So given, so given this, I know that the variance of F, which is the variance of MN, is equal to, you know, the expected sum I between one and N of mi minus mi plus one squared, right? And note that here already, so if we look at this sum, the last sum in this sum is basically uh, what we had uh, here, right? So I have a sum over a bunch of terms where the, la the last one of them is just, you know, the average influence of that. Okay, so all we all we want to we want to say now is that you know the that this sum. So what we want to show is that this sum is less or equal than the same than basically n times. right, expectation, which will follow from the fact that the expectation of mi minus mi minus one squared is less or equal than the expectation of mn minus m n minus one squared for all i. So in a sense, you know, you, you can think about, so, so those differences are increasing in expectation. You know, I have, so I have this process that starts here and first, you know, I reveal that first coordinate and then the second and the third. And every time I reveal a coordinate, I get some information about where, what the final value of F will be, right? First time here, I have like f of zero, which is just the expectation of f over the entire discrete hypercube. And then I reveal the first bit. So, you know, maybe I'll have, I have f here. You know, this is going to be f of x1. I mean, this point is x1. And then I have f of x1. So, you know, I revealed a little bit of information about where f is going to, where the martingale m is going to end up. And when I reveal the second coordinate, I reveal 
another little bit of information. And the point of this inequality is that the amount of information that is revealed in every step is increasing. Like the last step is telling you more than the first step. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Okay, so let's let's try to prove this inequality. So by definition, m i minus m i minus one. is equal to the gradient of f uh, at x i minus 1, or maybe let me write it like that, partial k i f x i minus 1 of f x i minus one times epsilon i, right? By definition, like I was here and then I moved either here or here. So, you know, the difference is determined by the gradient of f at this point times, you know, my offset. So now, another easy fact that basically follows from the same reason as the previous fact is that for all i, del i of f, or maybe for all j, the process del j of f at xi is also a marginal. And the reason is exactly the same reason. If I look at del j of f, that's also a multilinear function. So it's exactly the same proof. Right. So now all we have to write is the following thing. So the expectation of m i minus m i minus one squared. This is equal to um, the expectation of maybe let's uh, do it. So first we need to choose in which coordinate we move. And then we need to take the expectation over uh, basically where x i minus 1 is of del k i f x i minus one uh, square, right? Now let's uh, give this, okay, actually, no, let's, let's do this. So this, I claim that this is less or equal than same expectation over ki and now I want to take the expectation and now instead of del k i f at x i minus one, I want to take 
f at xn squared. So let's, uh, okay, Let, we'll prove this inequality in a second, but let's just agree that once we prove this inequality, then we're done. If we now take the actual expectation over Ki, then we just get, you know, um, which, yeah. So, you know, ki is just uniform. So what I get is just the sum over i, or maybe let, let me call it k of the expectation of del k x at xn squared one over n, which is equal to the sum of influences. Okay, so the inequality we wanted to uh, prove here will follow or actually is exactly this inequality. So all we have to, to show is like, this is all we're missing. Okay. But now there is actually not so much to do because we already know that what's written here, that, that this expression is a martingale. So, well, it's a martingale with respect to, so, so maybe in order to not confuse you, let's uh, denote by N, I, and T, del K, I, F, X, T. And I know that this is a martingale with respect to T. So I, I think of it as fixed. And so, and therefore Ki is also fixed and T is changing. So this is like a, a process, a stochastic process parameterized by T. So this is a martingale with respect to T, which means, which implies that uh, the expectation of n i t squared is increasing by Janssen. So maybe to elaborate on that, if I have any process n1 up to n uh, n where the expectation and I given and one up to n and I minus one is equal to n I minus one, then and for every convex function, we have that the expectation of phi of n i is so this is exactly the answer. Given all these values is bigger or equal. Right. 
Okay, so as you can see, it took me a long time to prove the Poincaré inequality, and I think I uh, maybe even like confused you a little bit in the middle, but does anyone have any questions so far? Okay, good. So, so now let me uh, step back for a second and I want to talk about different ways to sample a single random bit. So here for every coordinate, you know, at some point we sampled this coordinate, it was equal to zero. And then, you know, we tossed the coin of probabilities half and half. And then, you know, we got plus and minus one. There are other ways to sample a random bit. For example, I can do, I can have the, the following scheme. So maybe first I toss a one half, one half coin. If I get uh, heads, I toss a one quarter, or actually let's do, two thirds, one third coin. If I get heads again, my sample bit is one. And if I get tails, then my sample bit will be minus one. And maybe here, if I get tails, then also I toss, but now like a one third, two thirds coin. And if I get heads, then my sampled bit will be plus one. And if I get tails, then it's going to be minus. So do you agree that like it's still a 50-50 probability to get plus or minus one, right? But instead of just doing you know one sample of a bit, in a sense, I sampled something which is like less than a full bit. When I know, when I tell you the result of this coin, it gives you some information on what the final result is likely to be, right? If I get heads, it's going to be more likely to be heads than tails. But, you know, I still need to toss another coin in order to know, like, what the final bit is going to be. And, you know, we can come up with infinitely many schemes like that, like infinitely ma many algorithms that are going to sample eventually a random bit. And I claim that every such scheme, so this is an example of the scheme, but every such scheme has a one-to-one -one correspondence to some martingale xt such that x0 is equal to 0 and x1 is either minus 1 or plus 1. So this particular example is the following martingale. 
So, so now just for convenience, you know, the, the values of time here will not be integers. They'll be, you know, fractions of the, the interval zero one. So this, this particular example corresponds to the following thing, you know, x0 is, is here, x1 is going to be with probability one half, it's minus one half. So th this is minus one, this is plus one. So x at time one half is going to be, you know, minus one half with probability one half and plus one half with probability one half, right? So x one half is either here or here. And then, you know, x one is, is going to be sampled in the unique way so that this is the martingale, so, you know, if I was here, since this interval is three times longer than this interval, I have, you know, uh, relative probabilities of, you know, one third and two thirds to jump in every direction. Questions about this? So, you know, if, if this is kind of a way to sample a fraction of a bit, I can also, you know, I can also find if P is the unique solution to one plus P over two log okay. one plus P. So Ronen, a question, should it be like one fourth and three fourth instead of one third and two third or? Uh, uh, or? Wow, yeah, sorry. I slept very badly tonight, but yes, it should be fourth. Yeah, that, that was completely dumb. Sorry about that. But, you know, I'm very glad you are following. Uh, yeah, so if P is the unique solution to this equation, so this is, you know, the point where the entropy I have left is exactly one half of the entire entropy that we have in sampling one bit, then, you know, ideologically I can you know, I can just set x one half is equal to, okay, I guess p is a bad, it's a bad notation, let's call it q. One half, x one half is q with probability, you know, one half and minus q with probability one half. And then I get that, you know, h of x one, the entropy at, I'm not going to define it because it's not going to be important later. It's just for the sake of example is, you know, is equal to one half the entropy of X1, meaning that, you know, I just, instead of sampling an entire bit in terms of entropy, I sample half a bit and then I sample the other half that's left. And we can also do it infinitesimal, right? So another way to sample, which will be, uh, which is the main way we're going to focus on la later on. So actually two more ways, which are continuous.
So the first mm -hmm. one. Should we take a break or you want yeah, to yeah. I, I I ju I, I'm just going to write two more lines and then we can take a break. Sounds good. Thanks. Okay. So the first one I can. We're going to show that there exists a process xt such that, first of all, xt is a martingale. Stack, and second of all, the absolute value of xt is always equal to t. So in particular, x0 is 0 and x1 is 1. But you know, I always know the absolute value. That kind of means that you know xt has to jump between the curve, you know, plus t and minus t. And that process, if you think about it for a bit, it's like kind of a continuous way. If I go from you know, t to t plus dt, I only give you a, an infinitesimal information about where x1 is going to end. And the second process is going to be xt is just going to be bt stop at plus minus one. So B at the minimum of T and the stopping time T ta, ta, which is the smallest S such that BS is plus minus one. Where B is a Brownian motion, which I will define later on. So this is kind of just food for thought, okay? But yeah, may, now, now in the break, maybe I'll let you stare at those two things and you know, try to think about them. Okay, continue in a few minutes, I guess. Ah, continue in a half an hour, I guess. Maybe we can take a quick question or so before we break. Ah, of course, yeah, many quick cool questions. Any questions? Uh, okay, so let's meet in at 11.